Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in, I guess, uh, third summer of Hoover's Policy Boot Camp, a great institution. Um, it's wonderful to be back in, uh, in California and have the opportunity to discuss important matters with uh, students. And because we have uh, about one hour, now 58 minutes, to cover a semester's worth of material, let's get down to, uh, let's get down to our subject. The subject is capitalism, socialism, and liberty. In a sense, uh, capitalism and socialism are answers to a question. Who controls? Who controls trade? Who controls industry? Who controls production, distribution, and consumption? And you can provide a preliminary answer on one foot. According to capitalism, individuals, private individuals, make the decisions, generally and for the most part, that count on trade and industry, production, distribution, consumption. Socialism gives a different answer to the question, who controls? Generally and for the most part, the state controls the important decisions about trade and industry, production, consumption, distribution. The reading assigned for this session is a great book by uh, a distillation uh, of a great book published by uh, Friedrich Hayek in 1944, The Road to Serfdom. The central thesis of Hayek's book is that socialism, the economic system according to which the state makes the major decisions about production, consumption, and distribution, socialism if realized, issues in totalitarianism. Which you ask, totalitarianism of the left or totalitarianism of the right? Communist totalitarianism or national socialism, fascism? And Hayek's controversial answer in 1944, this internationally acclaimed economist who was born in Austria, was educated in Austria, began his career in Austria, then moved to London School of Economics. Uh, his answer was, socialism is the root source of both totalitarianism of the left and totalitarianism of the right. A controversial claim then, a controversial claim today. Importantly, though, for us, Hayek backs up his controversial claims with very powerful arguments. The distillation of his lengthy book that we've read for today provides a kind of introduction to those uh, arguments. Um, we, certainly I, would be very pleased if as a result of today's discussion uh, you were keen to follow up and read, read the book itself. Now, despite Hayek's arguments, Capitalism has never ceased to be sharply criticized uh, within Western liberal democracies. The criticisms that arise largely from the le left, for the most part from the left, but there are conservative criti criticisms of capitalism. Today, as you may have noticed, uh, on the campuses, the critique of, ca of capitalism has enjoyed a kind of resurgence. There's a kind of assault on capitalism, on the ideas of capitalism on campus. If you want evidence of that, and if you've had your eyes open at your various colleges and universities, you won't need much additional evidence. But if you wanted more evidence of it, you need only look at the uh, proposal for a uh, public school ethnic studies curriculum, curriculum that the state of California proposed, made public this summer. An article about that uh, curriculum appeared in the Wall Street Journal by a colleague of ours here, Bill Evers. Um, about this curriculum, its purpose is to provide guidance for, for the public schools in dealing with, I quote now, the interdisciplinary study of race, ethnicity, and indigeneity with an emphasis on experiences of people of color in the United States, close quote. It also aims to illuminate, I quote here, the study of intersectional and ancestral roots, coloniality, 
hege hegemony, and a dignified world where many worlds fit for present and future generations, and ex-disciplinary, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce it, ex-disciplinary, loving, and critical practice of holistic humanity. Actually, I can't be confident to understand exactly what that means, but the authors are clear that that approach to ethnic studies involves a harsh critique of capitalism. This is what they say about capitalism. It is, quote, a form of power and oppression, an expression of, quote, patriarchy, racism, white supremacy, and ableism. Now, that's fashionable terminology, but it's fashionable terminology for an old critique of capitalism, a long-standing critique of capitalism, a critique of capitalism that's at least as old as Karl Marx, about whom I have more to say in a moment. What is the old accusation against capitalism? That it rewards greed and selfishness, that it divides people into classes, that it erodes community and association tradition and religion, that it generates atomized individuals. We who care only for ourselves, know only for ourselves, do not know how to form friendships and practice citizenship. And moreover, untended, unregulated, it produces massive forms of inequality. Again, I emphasize the new critique of capitalism with the newfangled jargon is really a restatement of the old traditional criti critique of, of capitalism. It turns out, according to the polls, that if you ask young people under the age of 40, do you have a favorable opinion of uh, socialism, a majority say yes. If you ask people older than 60, a majority say no, they don't have a favorable opinion of socialism. The favorable, favorable opinion that young people have, so, have of socialism in part stems from a failure to understand socialism. Many people today equate socialism with a progressive political agenda. Less war, more unions, attending to the environment, less focus on, uh, on profit, and so on. Perhaps, uh, certainly, in, in America, in the, United, in the United States in 2019, universal health care, fluidity in the borders, and so on. What they don't mean, or at least they haven't thought through, is the classic meaning of socialism, which again, state, to use Marxist language, state control of the means of production. To use Hayek's language, to remind you of Hayek's language, central planning, meaning in Washington, D.C., we make all the important decisions. What should be produced? How much of it should be produced? What, does, what salaries should be set at? What the costs of products should be sold at? And so on. That's central planning. Most young people who praise socialism mean by that. They mean progressivism. But here, Hayek's warning, again, is very important without meaning to embrace the socialist ideal in its pure sense, elements of the political agenda can lay the foundations for a full-bodied socialism. That's the danger against which Hayek warns. In fact, he begins the excerpt that we read, I should, the distillation that we read in the following way. He points out that many of the people who are most responsible for the triumph of national socialism in Germany loathed national socialism, were socialists who wanted to make the general public better off by taking decisions, economic decisions, out of the hands of individuals and placing them in the hands of the state. So that the state, with the best of intentions, could organize economic life to benefit us all. Uh, you remember that early on in the uh, distillation, Hayek distillation we read, Hayek uh, quotes the German uh, poet Holderlin, 
who says, the surest way to establish hell on earth is to try to build heaven on earth. An early critique of the socialist aspiration. Now, young people, and this is not young people's fault, it's older people's fault for failing to provide a proper education for young, younger people, often lack a historical understanding. Often they bandy about the term socialism without realizing that as a matter of simple history, everywhere it's been tried, socialism has failed. And by failed, I mean produced, not merely oppression, but grinding poverty for the people, the common people that it was meant to uh, help, beginning with the Soviet Union and on to Venezuela today. Moreover, countries that are often thought to be great exemplars of the socialist ideal, Scandinavian countries of Northern Europe, are really uh, uh, significantly capitalist countries these days. And as Hayek points out, and we'll look at a passage in which he emphasizes this, don't be confused. We hear the term social democracy or socialist democratic socialism. Hayek already in 1944 is, is discussing the term democratic socialism and rejecting it. Why? We must distinguish a liberal democracy, he says, a free market system that provides certain minimums, food, shelter, clothing, ensures that all citizens have a minimum of food, shelter, and clothing. This emphasizes Hayek, no doctrinaire libertarian he, this Hayek emphasizes is consistent with the free market system. Social insurance, insurance schemes providing minimums, this is consistent with the free market system, argues Hayek. What is not consistent is central planning or a determined to achieve, we sometimes refer to substantive equality. There's a world of difference between governments setting out to ensure that everybody has the same income and a government that sets out to ensure that nobody falls below a certain minimum, assuming that the political societies have reached a certain level of, of affluence. Certainly we have reached that from Hayek's point of view. 